is this the best Game of Thrones book? Well, if you want to discuss it and find out, then you've come to the right place. Today we are reviewing the second novel in the A Song of Ice and Fire book series by George R. R. Martin, A Clash of Kings. After reading this book I didn't know how to think or feel. I was unable to process my emotions. So let's talk about it. FYI, there will be spoilers in this video, you have been warned, proceed with caution. Before we get started, I just want to address the elephant in the room. The state of this book makes me very, very sad. It turns out that my rabbit also likes reading books as well. This book is just very well loved. I apologise if that is annoying. So this book obviously takes place following the events of the first book, Game of Thrones. However, this one feels like a much slower pace than Game of Thrones. I think Game of Thrones, because it was the first book, it was trying to grip you, it was trying to hook you into the series, which it definitely achieved. And then this one, things start to progress at a much slower rate. This is where the storylines don't move as quickly. You get a lot more information, you get a lot more historical context. There's a lot more world building and it does progress much slower, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. As always, George R.R. R. Martin is a brilliant writer. His prose is atmospheric, his descriptions are beautiful, his dialogue is unmatched. The way that he can encapsulate each different character and their different personalities is just so talented, to be honest. I have not seen the TV show, I've heard great things, but his writing style just has such an impact on my emotions, my thoughts, how I think, how I perceive the world. An author that can do all of that to me is brilliant. So I want to start off with discussing a little bit about the prologue. Normally a prologue in a book doesn't really have much impact on me, I could either take it or leave it. I kind of get that it's there just to start the story or allude to events further down in the book, so I do get it, but with a prologue I'm not normally that invested in it. However, the prologue in this book gripped me straight away. Particularly because you learn so much about that one character. So the point of view that we're following in the prologue is a character that we do not follow again in the rest of the book. But yet I got so involved in this character and so interested in them. I thought it was a good start to this novel. Another thing that I liked about this book is that you get the first point of view chapters for Davos Seaworth. Davos, Davos, potato, potato. He doesn't have that many chapters in this book, but we are introduced to his point of view. I mentioned in my review for the whole series of A Song and Item Fire that Davos is one of my favourite characters. I really like him, he's the most reasonable character and I enjoy reading from his point of view. By the way, if you want to see my review for the whole series, then I will leave that in the description box and on the screen for you to click and watch that as well. In this book we start to learn about Davos's loyalty to Stannis, but also his questioning over some of Stannis's decisions. And he's starting to think for himself a little bit more. He's a very pure, loyal character. Now if you've read Game of Thrones you do know that loyalty does not always pay off. Cough, Ned Stark, cough. But Davos is another loyal, quite honourable character. He does have his flaws but I just really like his perspectives and the way that he sees the world. In this book, we also meet another one of my most liked characters, and that is Brienne of Tarth. So in this book, again, she is very loyal to Renly, Rip Renly, unfortunately he does die, which I didn't think was gonna happen. This is one thing that I found with this book and Game of Thrones, is that you can never expect what is gonna happen. When Renly died, it did take me by surprise, and I was stunned, and I didn't believe it at first, because the way that he died was quite interesting. I was kind of sat there thinking, is he dead? But he is. And I think that that is one of the core themes in this book, is that anybody can die. Nobody has plot armour. Nobody is safe. Anyone can be taken away at any point. Such is life. I don't like plot armour. I don't like when somebody's kept safe just because they're a main character and because they're vital to the storyline. I really, really like that about this book. So although I liked Renly and I was a bit it was a bit gutted that he died, it adds to the the emotional impact of this book because you just can't expect anything. You never know what's gonna happen in the next chapter, and I love that. I like the element of surprise. And Brienne of Tarth is a brilliant character. Her character development throughout the whole series is really good, but I like that she is introduced properly in this book. And again, she's a very well thought out character as well. She's not your typical 
character, I find. As always, I loved Tyrion's chapters. He is also another one of my favourite characters. He's so witty, he is so funny to read from his point of view. He tries not to take things too seriously. He's very entertaining. However, in this book, I feel like we get a little bit more depth to his character. We start to learn about his past, his history, how he feels about himself his lack of self-confidence. Almost like he's putting on a show that he's more confident than he actually is. We learn about how he wants other people to perceive him. And we learn about his deep down views of love. There was one part of this book that again gave me a lot of shock, really stunned me after reading it. And I did feel down actually. It did make me feel sad and quite annoyed and frustrated. But that is the desired effect from this scene. This is what the author wants you to feel. And that is where Theon Greyjoy betrays the Starks and burns Winterfell. It's almost like Ned died at the end of Game of Thrones and then everything at Winterfell has fallen apart. The Starks are all separated. Winterfell has burnt to a crisp. So it was like a metaphor when Ned died for things to come for the Starks and how everything just unravels and falls apart around them. I really like in this book how it feels like Ned is still a main character even though he's passed away. So it's like his storyline didn't finish when he died in Game of Thrones because he is still constantly referred to, there's references to him throughout the book and it's like through other people's perspectives he is kept alive. His death triggered and sparked other plots which are then built upon in this book. I don't really like it when a main character dies and then they're not referenced again at all. It's like they're forgotten about. You don't get that with Clash of Kings. He is very much so still talked about. So as I mentioned earlier, in this book, there is a lot more context, a lot more discussion around the past and a lot more setting up foundations for future storylines and plots. And an example of that is how we do learn more about the Greyjoys in this book that was not in the first book. We have the Crow's Eye, Euron Greyjoy. We learn more about Theon's sister, Asha. And it just starts to implement and trickle storylines that will be later developed on in the rest of the series. And I'm expecting that some of these characters will have an even bigger role in Winds of Winter, if that's ever released. So I do like that. After the fast pace of Game of Thrones, it's actually really refreshing to learn more about other characters that we maybe didn't touch upon that much in the first book. And just this universe that George R. R. Martin has created, it feels like these are real people and these are real events. And it adds to that world building. One character that I do find a bit annoying, but that's just because of who the person is. Like it's not to do with any of George R. R. Martin's writing, it's just to do with that particular person's personality. And that is Catelyn. She is a bit annoying, let's be honest, but I think that is because being a mother is such a huge part of her identity. But she tries to involve herself in the political themes and play a huge role. But in the back of her mind, she's always got her son and the caring for him as a mother rather than the advising him as though he is a king. Catelyn does believe that her sons, Bran and Rickon, are deceased in this book after what happened at Winterfell and she never learns the truth about them, which is absolutely soul destroying. There is a huge political theme running through these books. It is a clash of kings. She, everything that she does, she's doing it for Rob and for the Starks. For example, when she goes over to Liaise with Renly, she does like to get stuck in, in the political themes rather than sitting back and letting the men take over it all. I do like that, but I also don't really feel like she's best placed for that job. She is filled with the type of love that only a mother would know. I feel this because I am a bun mum, but that does form a large part of her identity. And I think that that links to why she doesn't like Jon Snow very much at all, because he is her husband's son, but it's not her son. And because she is such a mother, she doesn't want to mother somebody who is not her son and she treats him very poorly because of that, which makes sense, but that does mean she's a very annoying character because what has John done wrong? It is not his fault at all. He's the one who's now an orphan. He doesn't have a mum or a dad anymore. And it's just really annoying that she is so cruel to him. There's a quote that I really like that is by Catelyn, one of my favorites in the book. And it goes along the lines of, 
kings are not supposed to have mothers. I think that you can also translate that quote over to Joffrey and Cersei as well. Although she does see him as more of a ruler and more of a king, she is still his mother. I think that that's quite a simple quote, but it hits hard. It's got a deep meaning to it. Let's discuss Sansa for a little bit. Another very annoying character. But in this book, we start to see Sansa's fairy tale dreams and hopes being destroyed. She does still cling on to little bits of hope. She's really trying to not have her viewpoints tarnished. However, she's exposed to such brutality and cruelty that I think it's chipping away at her bit by bit. It does feel like no one really has her back other than Tyrion. Again, I love Tyrion. And he doesn't make it obvious that he's got her back. He does it in a very subtle way. I think that the pacing of Sansa's perspectives beginning to change is really well thought out. It's not like one bad thing happens to her and then all of a sudden she's a negative Nancy. It's more of like multiple bad things keep happening and over time she is trying to cling on to hope but it's just not as strong as it was before. In this book we also learn more about Bran being a warg. We've got his wolf dreams and his connections to his dire wolf. I love the dire wolves. This is quite inspiring actually because he can no longer use his legs. However, he has the ability to be a walk, which means he's kind of using his legs through his wolf and he's constantly referring to being able to run and feel more free. So I really like that he is able to have that ability. But to be honest, I don't think his storyline progresses all that much in this book, but we're just learning more depth about his character, which I think is really important for all the characters to learn more about their values and their motives. We also have my favourite character, Arya, who pursues many names in this book. She poses as Ari, Weasel. She takes on other identities as well, but those are the main ones in this book. Her storylines and plots are so cool. The journeys and adventures that this little girl goes on are so, so incredible. Her chapters are very entertaining. Every time I turned the page and realised that the next chapter was from Arya's point of view, I was immediately excited to read it. And how does George R.R. R. Martin write so well as a little girl? She's not your standard little girl though, she's very different to Sansa. Arya is one of my favourite characters as well and her storylines and the things that she goes through and the hardships that she experiences, it's very inspiring because her perspectives are really interesting. One of the particular scenes in this book that I found really difficult to read and really emotive was when John needs to kill Corin Halfhand. You can almost feel his resistance. As he was resisting and hesitating against it, I was also experiencing that at the time. It's like I was there. It, do you know what I mean? Like it feels as though it's so real and you know that he doesn't want to do it even though Halfhand has told him himself to do it, that if it comes down to this, just do it. It hits deep. I've mentioned a lot of positives about this book. I am just going to touch upon a negative. So the only thing about this book that I was a little bit unsure of was that Danny's storylines feel very, very distant to everything else going on. So all of the other storylines from all the other characters feel very interlinked. They're all based in what's happening in Westeros and there's lots of similarities. They're all interconnected. Danny's just feel like a completely different book. Like I feel like you could take all of her chapters out of this and just put it in a different book. Obviously that is because she's not there. She's in a completely different place entirely. But I just don't really feel like her stories link to anything else happening over there. There's no consistent themes with the rest of the realm. She just feels really far removed in this book. Now I do know that this is setting her up for future plots and in the other books, we start to see more links and more connectedness to the rest of what's going on in the world. But in this particular book, it just felt a little bit odd and random reading her chapters. It was almost like I would get so invested in what was happening in Westeros. And then I'd read her chapter and I'd feel a bit like, like I've had to step out of the story to read hers and then go back into it again when the next point of view chapter begins from somebody else. And nothing from her really feels that important in this book other than the scene at the House of the Undying because that foreshadows future events. But other than that, nothing really happens to her in this book. It just feels very random. That's my only thing. So to summarise, my favourite characters in this book are Tyrion, Arya and Jon. I did mention earlier that I really like Davos, but I feel like he's probably a little bit better in some of the other books. I rated this book a 4 out of 5 stars. I thoroughly enjoyed it. 
I feel like Game of Thrones was the brilliant, most perfect first book to a series, but then this one, because we're already invested in the world, George R. R. Martin just adds to all the context and helps to build up to future plots and sets the foundations really well in this book. So is this the best Game of Thrones book? I know that this is a lot of people's favourites. I would say that this is up there. I do also think that A Dance of Dragons is up there. That might just be my favourite, but this one is a very, very close second. I just really, really enjoyed it. I thought it was a great change of pace from the first one, and there was some really juicy stuff that went on in this book, so a brilliant, brilliant novel, and a great addition to the A Song of Ice and Fire series. So that is my review. I'm going to put this book down now because it is quite heavy. If you've read the book, what did you think? I would love for you to leave me a comment and let me know your opinions and your reviews as well. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up to let me know that you did. I will also leave a link to my reviews for the first book in the series, A Game of Thrones, and for the whole series, A Song of Ice and Fire. So check the description box or my channel for those. If you enjoy my content and you want to see more from me, please subscribe because it's free and it just means that you're able to see my videos a bit easier. Thank you so much for watching this, I really appreciate it. I will see you next time, or rather you'll see me, and I hope that you have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye for now.